Okay, I've posted up for you in PDF form another set of notes. This one called Equilibrium of a System of Coplanar Forces. Now, you may have already discovered that it's there because it's been there about a week. You need to be able to refer to that. So whether you print it out or have it ready for you to look at, we'll come back to this in a moment. But I want to revisit a couple of things from what we did last week when you were up and we looked at the spanning of an area with those three little model things. And remembering in this particular unit called Civil Structures, we can look at lots of different ways that engineers build with structures, but the basic ones, the ones that we looked at in that time were a beam, which was represented by a line and two little triangular natured points at the ends, suggesting that there was something loading here and the supports would be these two ends. And it's re representative of say a bridge or a span across some sort of gap. Um, the other one we looked at was the arch which we made up from those blocks that were cut with slight angles to them so that the angles all matched together and you finished up with a single structure where the loading runs down the sides towards the edges and you've got the space underneath. So you had to have something strong at the sides called abutments to stop the loads from spreading. So that was one of them. So you had a beam, you had an arch. And then finally we looked at the idea of triangulating things because triangles are stable structures and you get those members joined at pins that you can create triangles out of and you form what's classic truss shape. Um, and that would be a similar thing to a, a beam, but only on a larger scale. And so again, you can put reactions and you've got loads acting down. So those were the structures, a so beam, arch, and this type, this one here just called a truss, but it's simply a beam in a sort of larger form. Actually, you know, you could look at the beam as being made up of tiny little trusses as well, but for our purposes, the beam is just a single item. All right, so that's where we were in those particular structures. For the next three lessons, the ones I'm gonna do on this little taping mechanism now is that they're gonna basically focus on just the beam. So an equilibrium of a system of coplanar forces, we need to just make sure we're still familiar with our terminology. Equilibrium means that basically it's in balance. Nothing's happening. Now you can achieve equilibrium by having all of the forces cancel each other out by balancing up. If you draw a force diagram that comes around and there is no gap left at the end, there's no resultant, the forces are in equilibrium. If however there is a gap, then there will be a resultant. That resultant can be canceled out by putting in an opposite to it. So you have an equal and opposite force to any resultant. That's called the equilibrium, and it would cancel out the forces. So therefore, again, you have a system of equilibrium. Now coplanar means all in the one plane. We're keeping it nice and simple. And we looked at this in the preliminary course. So it's just a revision element. Conditions of equilibrium, there is no resultant. So when we look at it analytically, we are saying that all the forces that we have, vertical components, horizontal components, those forces are all gonna equal zero. If that case takes place, that's one condition. Basically what that says is that you're looking at your forces in a way, so that back to our little structures here, if we've got only vertical forces, so those are vertical forces and these two are vertical forces, then those two together add up to those two. Now the, the balance might be different because it's not quite equal in terms of positioning. This one looks like it's in the center. So for argument's sake, if that was 10 Newtons, and this was in the center of the beam, what would happen here is you'd have five Newtons at either side. The total here is 10, and the total down is 10. So basically equilibrium, they cancel each other out. So that's the case for a beam. That's, arch is a little bit more difficult because you've got angles happening and things going on in different ways, but for the main, that's the situation. Now, that also has another thing going on here, and that is that every force is vertical. But what if we introduced an angled force, something coming in on a slight angle at one point? It doesn't really matter what it is. Um, for the argument's sake, it can be five newtons. If that's the case, I'll just change to another piece of paper so it's a bit clearer. If that's the case, we have now introduced horizontal forces into the scheme. So not only do we just have, I'll go back and draw that again. So we've got a 10 coming down. We've got a five coming in over here, 10, 10. Now it's no longer five and five. Another thing about when we make a structure like this is we don't want only, well, we, 
We've got to be careful that we don't make it so it's grabbed at both ends. When something is loaded, it will bend. So it will want to bend into this shape somewhere. And as it bends, that because that's now long, that is now a circumference, it's longer than the distance of that cord, that would mean that this is shortened and will come away from the edge. So if I had, for argument's sake, I'll put a beam in, and I put it right up against the edge of my supports on both sides, and then I load it, and it bends, it'll pop into that space between. It'll fall off the two supports, because it's now longer along there, so the distance across here doesn't work anymore. So we've got to be careful when we build something that we allow for that sort of movement. There's another type of movement that happens in structures too, and that is to do with expansion and contraction for heat. You'll see that on bridges too, where they have those grid things at the end, so you can allow for some expansion. But this one is more important because of the bending and the loading. It's probably more pronounced than, on, on, on average, it's probably more pronounced than the loading from temperature. Uh, so what we do is we create different points at the ends. We have a point that is gripping and another end where it's not gripping. We might have it sitting on a roller. Now that might seem a bit of an odd thing to do, but if you look at that from the perspective of the bend, when I load that now, that will try to bend down. It'll hold here and grip, but this end now can move slightly into that curve. And as it does, it moves along the roller. That may rotate. And then when it comes back unloaded, it'll roll back out, and that way it doesn't fall in. We represent those sorts of things, uh, um, sort of roller joints, can be drawn a bit like this. They have little wheels underneath, like a carriage. And that suggests that that end can move. Now if it can move, it can only move that way. This load is still being supported. But if it's moving in that way, then it's not actually reacting. It's not responding. There's no resultant here. It's actually bending with it or moving with it. So you cancel that out. So when we build a bridge or we put a beam together like this, what we'll finish up saying, I've got this drawing here started. So at this end, we've got a roller. This end is a pin and a roller. What happens is that that end there can only support the vertical loads. It can't stop the horizontal loads because the roller will move. Over here though, we'll have a reaction to the vertical and a reaction to the horizontal because it's pinned, it's held. So this is actually the only place where horizontal forces are being stopped. Now what that means is that when we go back to this one we were looking at with a slight angle in it, five, if we knew, for example, what the value of that horizontal force here was, so it could be calculated using sine and using the angle in here, which one you want to use, whether it's cosine or sine, it doesn't matter, you'll find a value for that five then this is going to equal that. So let's say, for example, just on that, it looks like it's probably gonna be like 1.7 or something. If that's the case, then this is 1.7 over here. They're the only two. There's no other horizontal forces involved, so that one and that one cancel each other out. However, now we've gotta take into account the vertical component of that force. Now, if that was five, that's, I'm just putting numbers in here, 10, which we had before, that could probably be, on the look of it, maybe something like three. Um, we could probably work out what the angle was if that was the case. But now we've got 13 coming down and we've got no longer, we don't have it equal, it's not centered, so it won't be five and five, but what will happen is whatever that is, reaction A vertical, we usually name them by virtue of A and B, you know, left and right. So if that's reaction, reaction A vertical, this would be reaction B vertical, those two, R, A, V, plus R, B, V, must equal 13, if that's the values. So that's just basically where we, we're going. So those, I'm bringing that point in just to show you the role of supports, because that's going to come out in the notes. So if we go back now to the notes and have a look at them, making a nice mess of the table there with pen coming through. Okay, we'll clean up job later. First off, we, we're saying that the horizontal and vertical components must be equal. Now that's fine, we've just looked at that. But this one here about the moments is important too. Um, just going back to last term and when we looked at moments, I'll put another 
piece here and just remind you of something again very important piece of information I can have a situation that looks like it's balanced that is that the vertical and horizontal forces all cancel each other out but it isn't balanced and the one we used was that we had something like a block and you had a force coming down here say 10 and we had a force here say 10 and already you can see okay yeah they balance there are no horizontal forces and even if we did have horizontal forces say we do this make it look like it's balanced say that's five and five and they're in line with each other across there so those two yeah definitely cancel each other out but this and this may in terms of the value there's 10 newtons up 10 newtons down look like they cancel each other out so the sum of the forces in a vertical way is zero but that's not enough because what's going to happen is that box is going to spin it's going to spin about the middle particularly as it's a square or we should have mentioned that before if it isn't a square it'll still be the center between the two distances and the distance is important because what that creates is let's say for our argument's sake this is one unit here and this is one unit here if i hold that point then i've got a turning effect a moment and the moment value is always the force times the distance to the force a perpendicular distance by the way remember that too so it's at right angles one times ten which means i have a turning effect of ten newton meters if it's meters turning in that direction and then another ten because i've got one times ten over here plus another ten newton meters I'll just make sure i'm able to put it inside the frame and so it is equal to 20 newton meters and that is a turning effect so do i have the last condition the sum of the moments in any direction equal to zero and the answer there is no this is not balanced mind you if i did do something like this and then did another one over here so now I've got 20 running down, 20 going up, 5 going there, 5 going here. They balance, they balance, they cancel, they cancel. Now you've got equilibrium. Because the effect of doing that is to add a moment effect in the other direction that would be the opposite of that. So I would minus 20 Newton meters from that guy because I'd have one going in that direction, one going the other direction, cancel each other out, and then I do have equilibrium. Bring all that back to mind because those three conditions are going to help us solve problems related to beams. So those three conditions become our secret to answering questions related to beams. All right, so back to the notes. Let's look at some of the information provided here. I've already covered a little bit of it, so it's fairly quick. Um, conventions about forces, we've already talked about this in the preliminary course. We tend to talk about positive as being up and to the right. This is Cartesian geometry almost, you know, a time, um, with a number line or um, any of the geometry lines. And the Z might be coming out here in that case, but we don't do the Z, it's coplanar. And this is the moment effect, clockwise, anti-clockwise is positive, clockwise is negative um, convention. If you decide to do it another way because it makes the math a little easier, just make sure you note that at the beginning. The other thing is that I've just talked about is the type of point forms. So this is the hinge support where it's actually holding, so there will be a force. Just look at the way they've drawn this too on here. You've got a horizontal component, you've got a vertical component. Until you actually know what those two are, you won't be able to tell either the value of the reaction, its magnitude, or its line of action. And because you don't know for sure where it's acting, in what direction, we draw a squiggly line. The squiggly line just indicates that we know that there's something there. We suspect because of those two angles that it's going up in that direction, but we don't know its value yet, and we don't know its actual direction. Um, so we do have a sense of it, but we don't know its line of action. The other ones, the roller supports, as I said before, it's got this little triangle with circles underneath it, but you can also have them done as rockers, so it actually rocks rather than slides, or even slides along a smooth surface. Um, in real bridges, they tend not to use any of these, as we'll talk more about bridges later. They tend to use a rubber bearing now that moves in all sorts of directions, and it's a big pot, and they put the rubberized material held together with some 
uh, composite matter and it moves in all three directions. So it's good for side and lateral movement as well as the uh, sort of movement we get from expansion, contraction and the loading. Okay, now, what does this mean to us when we start solving problems? And here are two examples, pretty much like what I sketched. Um, here we've got forces running down onto a beam. You have a roller over this end, so it only has a, a vertical support. There's no horizontal force there because the roller will slide. Here, the only horizontal force can be there. We move it, face it that way, even though we don't know its value, because if we look at the 20 and the 5 here, the component of that is heading back this way. So this one must be acting against it. And the same with the reaction here. And note also we've got an RAV, like I did before, reaction at A vertically, reaction at A horizontally. And a little bit more complicated now when you get to a truss, in the truss form. Uh, same deal, as you can see it's very familiar like a beam, just the same idea. Now you've got a force acting at the top. This could be something like wind or anything really. It could be a loading that's applied, applied there. And that's going to cause it to want to travel that way. It's actually going to try and lift the bridge because it's actually going to pivot around that point. But the reaction here, in terms of the vertical and horizontal components, that must equal that. So in this case, I can tell you straight away that RAH is 18 kilonewtons. Why? There are no other horizontal components to any of the forces. So RAH is 18. But that might not necessarily be all the information because it's not balanced. You can see it's going to spin because there's a distance between things. So let's look at a typical problem. First off, I'm going to do these analytically. I'm going to work through the book. I'm not going to do these drawing them out for you because we can see what's going on pretty easily from the notes if you read through them with you. First off, what you will need to do is convert the space diagram, which is its positional elements, distances and weights, and all the other extraneous material, like what the truss might look like, and just make sure you understand how to get it into a free body diagram. And the free body diagram, in the case of this one, really isn't much different, except you've removed the rollers. Um, so you're basically supporting it now in terms of the drawing just showing all the forces involved and the distances between the forces. So that's your free body diagram. Again, notice that we put in the squiggly line here. The squiggly line means, basically, we know there's something there. It's the resultant of those two forces. That's a single force replacing those two forces. It's going up that way somewhere, but we don't exactly know where. So at the end, when we finally work out the calculation, we're going to have one force over here and one force here, not two. We'll have one reaction, but the reaction will be pointed up in some direction like that. Okay. When we start solving one of these problems, we know that we can add up all the vertical and horizontal forces. So the first thing we can say is that there are no horizontal forces, so straight away we know something about that. It's going to be zero. That's good. That means there's one less thing to calculate. So really, already, we've solved something, which means, of course, that we now know the line of action of the resultant. So even though we put the squiggly line in, we do that as a matter of course because we, until we've analysed it, honestly, you could have just gone and put that straight in like that. There would have been no problem with that. If you're smart enough to realise that's vertical, that's vertical, that's vertical, no other horizontal forces, there is no need to do that. But just doing it on the drawing here shows you that that's the standard way of approaching the problem. So we can say straight away there are no, no value there. The next thing we can say is that We've got a balance, but we don't know exactly whether it's neatly balanced. Look at the distances. 1, 1 1.6, 2.6, 1.3. They're all over the place. Also, 8, 9, and 7, they're not balanced. It's not like that simple one with 10 coming down like we had in the first instance. So there was 5 and 5. We can't do that. We can add them up. We certainly know that it's 8 plus 9. That's easy. 17 plus 7. So we know that we're going to be looking at a value that totals up to those things. So, it's right, so we know that RA vertically and RB vertically are going to add up to 8 plus 9 plus 7. And that's not too difficult. But how much? How much is RA and how much is RB? What's the share? And so what we have to do is take moments. And to do that, normally what we do, just to get into the habit of it, is because this is the pin joint, and we know all the time that the, whole, the roller is always only going to be vertical, we tend to hold this one. We just make the argument that we'll hold that point. 
that means that this guy here is rotating that way and these others are rotating in the positive direction. That's the balance in moments. So you can see the very first thing we've done here is just once we've analyzed all of that stuff, we've worked out that there is no vertical or horizontal, so that's easy. We can work out what the vertical is, but we don't know the proportion. We first have to find out from moments what is the division. Hold that and calculate it. Moments must balance. So one times eight, so we've got one times eight in a negative direction here. So they're saying it's going down that way because he's nominated this as positive. That's fine. You can do it the other way if you want, but that's easy. So just make it minus, that's the convention. So clockwise is negative. One times eight minus eight. Now, be careful here because it's the total distance. One plus 1.6. So it's nine times 2.6, force times distance. Nine times 2.6. Then the third force is way over here, so it's 1, 1.6, 2.6, comes out to 5.2, 7 times 5.2, and both of those are negative. So all three moment forces are going in a negative direction, and they are all balanced by one force at a distance of 6.5, 6.5 being the total distance across. Do the calculations, add that up, you get 8 plus 23.4 plus 36.4, 67.8. Then to get the resultant out of the equation, you're going to divide by both sides or divide one into the other. So divide 6.5 out and you finish up with 10.43. 10.43 is RB. So if 10.43 is RB, we can now go and say, okay, the sum of the vertical forces now must balance. So let's go back in. The one we don't know, RA, must now balance 8 plus 9 plus 7, and then the 10.4 comes into it, which is going up. So those are totals going down, then you've got one total going up, and those two totals come out to get you 13.57 for RA. But you should run through that, just do a quick calculation on it to see that it works. It should be fine, and at, at the end you can write down the reaction at the hinge, is over that side. That, this is the one with the hinge, is 13.57, and the reaction at the roller, which was the vertical over here, is 10.43. Okay, straightforward. Good example there for you to work to, hence why I'm not writing it out. Now, we're going to jump over to the next problem, which has got some extra stuff happening in it. This time, it's got some vertical stuff going, horizontal stuff going in, and one force going up as well, just to make it a little bit more interesting. So now we do the same analysis. Here is our space diagram, everything in relation, distances, forces, and all the extra information you don't really need. We don't need to know that the rollers look like that. So what we're doing here now is we change it to a force diagram, same deal, put in your vertical force, your horizontal forces here, don't know where it is, put the squiggly line in. This time, though, we do know that there are two component forces. What he's done here in his solution is he's decided that he'll change, up here, yeah, that he's going to change the 25 into its two component forces. Now, you've got to be really careful when you do that, that you don't lose sight of the fact that, I'll just change to a different point, so I, this is a bit thick. That point there is the point of application. When we do it like this, you can fall into the trap of shortening your distance and assuming that the force is here. That vertical force acts there, and the horizontal force acts here. That's important because when we do the moments down the bottom here, you are w working to the 4 and that force. So the 25 sine 75 acting down must be multiplied by 4. If you put it over here, you might have made a calculation error. You might put it down as being less than four. How you would do that, I, you'd have to, I'd have to calculate it to work out what that might even look like. But it's, it's a mistake you can make. So that one there is acting there, and so is this guy, acting through that point. And that's important because the line of action of those two forces runs through here. Later on, when I do the moment's force, I don't have three forces to worry about. And those, well actually four when you add up the the, the, I don't have to worry about the reaction vertically because it's passing through it. I don't have to worry about the reaction A passing through there too. No distance, no moment. 
And because that one's line of action continues along, passes through that point, don't have to worry about it. And because this one, even though it was acting away, still passes through that point, I don't have to worry about it. So when you come down and look at this working out and you go through it, you can see that there isn't a 25 cos 75 and there isn't a 30 cos 60 because those two are eliminated in the moment. There's no distance, no turning effect. They are important for the horizontal and vertical componentry, but they are not important in terms of the moments, which is another good reason why that's a good spot to hold. The more things you can eliminate when you're doing maths, the better. Try and keep it for one unknown, one unknown, and then we can solve it. So, same deal. You can read through this, follow it through. First off is using some of the moments. Does this process negative force, so you've got the first one is going down here, 25 sine, coming from this diagram, 25 sine times four, there's your distance. The next one, 10, is going up, so that was a negative. Make sure you put in a positive, it's going up because it's going in the positive direction, and it's 10 times 10, because it's the six plus the four. So you've got, oh, hang on, six and five, I'm reading that as a six, that's a five, hence nine. So four and five, nine. Then down, minus, this is going down, and the only one you're looking at is that one there, because this component passes through it. You don't even have to worry about that. There is an alternative, and he's got the alternative as going this way. You could use that distance and not do the horizontal and vertical components. Only thing wrong with that is that whilst that solves for this particular situation here, it doesn't help you solve the horizontal. It's much better if you do do the ver verticals and horizontal components because then you can do the summing of the verticals. At some point in the argument, you're going to have to find out what that is anyway. So whether you want to calculate that distance or just take those two really doesn't matter. All right? So th there's an alternative within the alternatives. I prefer this one because you've already done it, you've calculated it, it's given to you. Here's a chance of another error. If you try and do too many calculations, you always ring, bring in a chance of error. Either way, you finish up with a reaction B, the only balance, and in this case it's 20.6. Now you can revert back to the other horizontal and vertical componentry thing. We know that this one here has a value, we know that this has a value, those three things must add up to zero, so you can do that. So here we go with those, just adding them together to make it zero. Note that you've got the positive direction of one and the positive direction of two. Those two together add up to that one force. Make sure you understand that. That one there plus that one are balancing that one because they're both going in that direction. Then finally, you get the, uh, the value is plus 8.53. Turn over the page and you can see the solution for the verticals. Again, you're only using the component of the vertical forces. And again, you get a simple answer. Now that's not the end of the story because you have now discovered the horizontal component and the vert vertical component for RA. You know what RB is because it's come straight out. came out over here when you did the moment problem. And because it's going vertically, that's it. End of story. We've got that one. But over here, we've got two components. We need to find the original uh, or the resultant from those two. Those two are components of this one force, the RA. And that's not too hard to do because you can use Pythagoras theorem there. So this is the right triangle. So you've got the hypotenuse of right triangle, square, square, find the square root of the sum. And then the angle can come from the opposite sides. So he's taken 10, opposite on adjacent. It doesn't really matter. One of the reasons why he's probably done opposite on adjacent is that those were two values you already had. If you made a mistake finding R, you got an error then that error would compound if you use the hypotenuse in here. You could, if you're confident, you can use sine, you could use cos. But that's just a good practice because every time you do a calculation, you could reach, make an error. So if you put the hypotenuse in and then use the sine relationship instead, then you've got a possibility of introducing an, a secondary error. But that's okay too in exams, as long as you show it and we can work out what you did wrong, or what didn't work out right. Okay, so that's an introduction to those things and over the next few pages you've got some problems to work with that you can do. My suggestion is that you try some of these or the ones that are said to do, do uh, graphically leave for the moment 
and just go through and do the analytical ones. And so if we quickly have a look at the first couple, you should be able to work with me here that these are pretty straightforward. Here you've got 300, 180 and 120. What they're saying this time is not where, what is the value of the forces you're told. Those two, 120 plus 180 add up to 300. What they're asking you is to find out where the position is. How far away is the 300? So this bar is two meters long. What is the position of the 300 relative to the right hand support? Relative to the right hand support, that's this support here. So this time what we're doing is we hold this guy. We work out the moment here is two times 180, going that way, must equal 300 times whatever that distance is here. Two times 180, so that's gonna be something, what is that, 360? No, no, no. So you've got 360 times one something times three, so it's gonna be one point something times three to get 360 adding up. So it's pretty straightforward. But it's just to give you, and it turns out to be 1.2, because 1.2 times 300 gives you one point or 360. So you do that though, just make sure you can do it, even though I can talk you through that now. Look at this one here. Here's a uniform beam. Now a uniform beam means that there is something else that you need to consider sometimes. It's 10.21 kilograms, uniformly loaded. So the beam itself has a load. So there's a little bit of load there, a little bit of load, a little bit, of, it's all uniformly loaded, all right? And it's, but it's a 10.21 all up. So what have we got? One, two, and four, six meters long. All six meters adds up to 10.21 kilograms. That has to be taken into account. Now, because it's uniform, you can concentrate all of that mass through the center of mass, which will be in the middle, the geometric middle of that length, two, well, two and four, six. So at three, somewhere here, there is a mass of 10.21 concentrated. There's some over here, there's some over here. In fact, there's some hole all the way along. But if you took the whole lot of the beam and put it in one place, it, uh, it works out to be exactly the same. But that's in kilograms. So that has to go to Newtons. So we multiply that by 9.8, which is why it's in this funny number. So you can pretty much suspect what it's gonna come back to, but I'll let you do the calculation. Um, so if you multiply that by 9.8, you can see where it's going. Then that's at three. So there's an extra meter there. And that comes into play in terms of the moments and calculations. So see how you go with that. Um, just work your way through them. This one's got your reactions, nice and easy. This one is going to be vertical, this one's vertical. There is no horizontal, so you don't have to worry about any wiggly line, but get used to thinking that way first up. Another one here with forces going up and down, turning over, you start to introduce some angles. Right? You also start talking about doing some of them graphically. Yeah, this one here, graphically. You can do that analytically anyway, and in the next video, I'll talk about how to do them um, graphically. All right, leave it at that for the minute. There's a fair few things there to do, just to work your way through. So, equilibrium of a system of coplanar forces. Um, next video is on how to do them graphically.